Hello everyone, welcome to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce, and today we're going to be doing a, a author horror spotlight. Today I have with us Carrie Legui. I said it right? Uh, yeah, that's it, yeah. All right, and she has a new book right now that's available on Amazon, and it's called Raptured. Carrie, welcome to the Horror Room. Thanks, man, I'm happy to be here. You too. And, um... So, Carrie, tell us a little bit about Raptured. So, Raptured is um, post-apocalyptic. So, what happens is the Pope announces to the world that he's heard a message from God. And the seven years of tribulation leading up to uh, Armageddon and the apocalypse is about to begin. The first step, uh, biblically speaking, is the rapture. All of the God's followers are supposed to be raptured into safety from all of the coming horrors that are going to follow through the next seven years. So in our take on that, uh, the government gets involved and they have created these followed shelters known as raptures. They've decided, along with the church, that the only people that are going to be saved are going to be the children. So society in general, I mean, you've got to remember you have people with kids, you have people without kids that never want to have kids. Like some, there are people that just lose it. And uh, our story follows seven different characters as they go through the different um, emotions and watch kind of how society falls apart. Our main character, Ava, has two children that she has to get to the rapture before all of this begins. And in order to get there, she's got to take a road trip north. And she's got to face off with everything that she kind of meets along the way. Um, She has her companion, Gideon, is a priest that is questioning his own faith when all of this kind of comes around. And so we kind of follow his struggle as well. Uh, Sam is a mysterious visitor. It comes out of nowhere, but he is claiming to have all the answers. He's claiming to have divine spiritual power and he has all the answers that they need to get through this. Some people trust him, some people don't, and the goal in the end is to get the kids to the rapture so they can be safe before the seven years kicks off. Now, this is book one of a five-book series, so there will be uh, the rapture, and then we'll follow up with the uh, trials and tribulations that kind of lead all the way up to the apocalypse and Armageddon, which is a war between heaven and hell. Now, going into writing this, this book, you knowing that it's, 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 it's going to be number one out of a five-part series, have you already thought ahead on how the next couple books are going to begin and end? Absolutely. Oh, I know. I know what's going to happen. I know how it's going to happen. Um, I have a loose. I'm halfway between a planner and a pantser, so okay. I. I plan very loosely and then I kind of let the story go in its natural direction. So I'm willing to change things as I go and things like that. So for right now, I have a vivid idea of what's going to happen, but if it actually ends up that way, I mean, we'll see (laughs) because (laughs) the characters do have a tendency to sometimes to take me off left sometimes. So now how long did did it take um, for you to think of the idea as well as put it on paper and get it out to Amazon? Yeah, so from conception, I mean, so I'm agnostic, like I was saying, I'm not a religious person myself. So the research part of it took a long time. Um, Reading the Bible is not an easy read. So that alone took a couple of months. But between uh, research, um, putting my ideas to paper, like planning out how the series is going to go, what I want each character to do, and then actually putting everything to paper, total process about seven years. Okay, that's a long time. Yeah, well, it was a long time brewing, and I wanted to make sure everything kind of ties together. When you're planning five different books, there's a lot of foreshadowing that has to go into the first book that doesn't, not, not all of it pays off right away. So to plan these little intricacies that kind of happen to tie the books together took a lot more time than I originally thought it was going to. So it, <laughs> it, it, it piled up on me, and I have a tendency to be a little bit OCD, especially like not just when I'm writing, but when I read other people's stuff, I tend to be like, well, that doesn't fit there. Maybe they should have done this maybe earlier in the book. And I'm 10 times worse on myself than I've ever been on any other author that I've ever read in my life. So it piled up. But um, with the second book, I'm not expecting it to take near as long. I'm thinking maybe a year and a half to two years, and we should see the second book on the shelves. Awesome. Now, 
have you gotten any, you know, when you were writing this up, were you worried about getting any flack from the religious and the non-religious? So, um, not so much worried about the non-religious. I think people okay. that are not religious will see this as fiction and will take it the same way they take Harry Potter. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's fiction. It's mythology. Um, religious people, I find I've been met with two different types of people, right? Like there's the what would Jesus do type, and then there's the what does the Bible say type. The what would Jesus do types are very welcoming and very okay with other ideas and other interpretations of what their book means. So they're they're usually okay. I get a lot of God bless you and I hope for the best for you and all that kind of thing. And that's that's nice. I mean, I figure it's meant with good intent, so I'll take it. Then there's the what does the Bible say people? And to them, I'm blasphemous and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, the Whore of Babylon in some cases. I've been I've been called almost everything but a white girl at this point by some people. So <laughs> it's um it's been I expected that some people were going to be not thrilled with it. But the thing that I always tell people is that if you haven't read the book, don't assume what I'm putting in there because you have no idea where I stand on it, uh, where I take the story. So for you to assume that it's blasphemous in nature, I mean, God gave me free will according to your book. So mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do with that? And they don't like that either. So we, um, we butt heads a little bit. I have learned to stop responding to most of the comments I did in the beginning. I've learned to stop doing that now. So I just kind of let them pile up and <laughs> I just tell them, you know, if they insist on a response from me, then I just say, please read the book. If you have a problem after you read the book, please bring it back to me. But for now, I'm not going to argue with people that I don't know based on assumptions that they have based on no, zero evidence. So I'm hoping that they'll at least read it and then get mad at me. Isn't it <laughs> weird as Americans how we can make an assumption about something without even reading it or fully reading it or even just pulling up one little piece out of it and then making a decision about something? Well, you make an assumption there because I'm Canadian and we do the same thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, North Americans. I mean, <laughs> wow. You know, you know what I mean? Like we, I know a lot of people, like we are friendly, you know what I mean? We're not all shitheads, but, um, you know, there's not that much difference really. Like we, we act like dumbasses sometimes too. We assume too much. We think we know everything. It all happens up here too. <laughs> I so, hate, I'm not telling my country. I'm sorry, other Canadians, but I'm just here for truth time. <laughs> now. What was some of your inspiration when you were coming out with the idea for Rapture in the series? So the idea came to me when I watched Donald Trump run for president. Whoa, okay. <laughs> to be completely honest with you, and it's not, I'm not getting political on anybody. It was, it was more about the fact that I watched how many people were so willing to blindly follow this man. And that's what gave me the idea about how far would people go when it comes to blind faith? You just, and it seems like it doesn't matter what happens or what's said or what's done there's always oh it's okay because this and it's okay because that and i'm thinking how far could you push that with people because it seemed pretty far some of the things that i seen um during that time and this is way back when he was running the first time right i this mm -hmm. was before he had ever become president but just watching how fast people assimilated it was disturbing how fast i watched some people go from very nice people to very confrontational and very just angry and aggressive. And it's an, I'm to be honest with you, I'm not even just talking about Trump supporters. I'm talking about the whole charade that surrounded the whole thing. People just got very extreme with their views very quickly and started cutting off family and started, you know, ignoring the logic that surrounded most situations. And it just, it very much fractured, not even just the states up in Canada too. It was a huge thing. It still kind of is. Um, so it just, politics and religion kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And the way that I watched some, not just Donald Trump, but some other politicians gain followers, I see a lot of the same thing from religious leaders and from cult leaders. What's we up? all have this huge problem. It's going to kill us all. And I'm the only one that can fix it. Yep. And that's what you get across the board. Whatever it is, they all pull something out of their magic problem hat. They say, this is a huge problem. You can't solve it without me. I'm the only one that can fix it. And you get that from politi pol uh, political leaders, from religious leaders, from lots of people across the board. But it's become almost a virus. 
in people's minds where they really believe that whatever it is that they follow has all the answers instead of saying, okay, well, maybe some answers come from here. Maybe some answers come from here. No, it's got to be all or nothing. It's whatever they put their their time into, it's got to be all or nothing. And I 100% agree with you when it comes to, and, I'm, I'm, and not all politicians, not all yes. churches. Right, exactly. But, exactly. but it's a huge chunk. Okay. Well, it's if I give you a chunk. box of Whoppers and I told you one of them was a ball of shit, would you eat the box of Whoppers? No. Right, it's not all the Whoppers, it's just one. Just, just one. one's a ball of shit. Yes. yes. Right. Nobody wants to eat that box of Whoppers. And that's the thing is I find that with a lot of it, it's not all politicians, it's not all churches, but if one of them's a ball of shit, I don't it's, know if I can trust really, any of them. Yeah, because cause it, it's a weird thing. And, and it's a weird thing. And this is where I agree with you when, when you say about cult leaders. Churches, politicians are cult leaders. Some, it, it's, a, it's, it's culty because... Even if they're followers, you could point out something. It could be clear as day. Let's say Donald Trump. Donald yeah. Trump is a murderer. Like it, it, it could, you could have a picture of him killing somebody and something, and uh, and uh, a cult follower would say, "Oh well, I'm, I mean, I mean, uh, pretty sure one of the Democrats killed somebody." You know what I mean? And and it's weird. It's like it's yeah, yeah, it's weird. And I even see that with liberals and, and yeah. we'll will will Joe Biden blah 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 well Donald Trump did the same thing and it's whole and it's like exactly. huh exactly exactly and that's the thing is my grandmother used to say you got two ears and one mouth for a reason and nobody's using either one of the two ears everybody's just so busy using their mouth yes. and the thing is that we all know our own opinions right we all know how we feel about uh, Donald Trump or this religion or that type of seafood or whatever. We all know what our own opinions are. We don't learn from that. We learn when we listen to other people. And if you ain't doing none of the listening, then you ain't doing none of the learning either. For this book, I, I've interviewed people that I don't agree with. Like I've interviewed priests and I've interviewed people of strong, like zealot faith. I've interviewed people... Like I've, I've talked to so many people that I don't agree with at all, but none of it hurt my feelings. I'm still standing here. They're still standing there. We parted on good terms. You know what I mean? We agreed to disagree, but we could do it on peaceful terms. Why that can't happen on a bigger scale, I'm not really sure of. But a lot of the subtext in this book is to show people what can happen, how far it can go when you let your blind faith lead you. And how bad it can get when none of the choices seem good. That's when you're at your weakest. And that's when they come for you. So we put you, we put our characters in a situation where none of your options are good. And that's when it comes. That's when your your savior, whatever you think is going to save the kids. I, I love that one, to save the kids. Whatever you think is going to save everybody, that's what you're going to put your faith into. And we're going to learn that that's not always the best plan. Even when it does seem like the right choice, it's not always the best plan. And a lot of this book, you meet a lot of interesting characters. I've gotten a lot of feedback on really great conversations and really interesting characters. So getting to know some of those characters and what makes them tick, I found made for a really good story, but it sets up so many of the other things that are going to come. Now, I didn't want to have a book that was all set up either, right? We have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. We have to have some kind of wrap up. So there is. But it does, it wraps up the story, but then it leads into the next one very nicely. So it's it's a very, very nice ease of continuance. If you read the first book and you don't like it, it's easy to put it down and never think about it again. But if you pick it up and you read it and you love it, then you're going to be sitting waiting for the next book. I've already got a list of 15, 20 people that are waiting wow. for the next book actively. So they um, people so far have really been enjoying it, but you are, I think... At this point, being anybody that's going to express yourself creatively, you're taking a chance, especially at this point in society. There's always like people can be very vocal about what they disagree with and they can put it on a very large, wide platform very quickly. So that's why I wasn't thrilled with the idea of doing an interview at all. I was super <laughs> nervous. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Can I do this? I can do this. It'll be fine. Um, but the thing is, is that I want I really want people to read the book before you decide how you feel about me or my views going on assumptions because I'm going to jump left and right. And so you'll be in part 
wanted the book and you'll be like, oh, this girl's crazy or whatever. And then you get to another part. Okay, well, no, she knows what she's talking about because look at what this character is saying. And then you jump to another part and you're going to love me and hate me at different parts of the book, depending on what point of view you're coming at it from. Because you're, there's, there's some good characters that you're going to hate the things they do, but you're going to agree with why they do them. So it's gonna it's very emotionally conflicting in some spots. Do you think it's challenging to be a woman horror author in the year 2023? No. I think we're <laughs> <laughs> like I've looked around and it's all dudes, man. It's a huge sausage fest in the genre. Um, I would love to see. I'm a huge fan of 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 uh, people like uh, Mary Shelley and Rice. Like I've been a, a fan of female horror for a long time, but the genre is very male dominated. Why that is, I don't know, but I'll tell you this, if you're a woman and you read this book, there are some parts that are gonna be way more horrific for you than there are gonna be for some dudes that read this book. And that's a voice that I feel is like missing in our genre, is there are plenty of things that are horrifying to women that would not bother a man as much. So. Mm -hmm. There, I feel like it's a, it's an under-recognized voice, but I feel like at the same time it's under-recognized because it's a very small voice in a very dark corner of the horror genre. Like a couple of us bitches back there going, help us, let us out. <laughs> like, I'm really hoping that through all this that I'll be able to meet some other female horror writers, whether it be indie or not, um, just to know that there are some others out there. I'd like some exposure to some new female horror stuff, I find a lot of the stuff I come across is by men. And that's not bad. I mean, mm -hmm. they, guys can write horror. They write, like, look at some of the greats. Like, he, Stephen is the king. Yeah. Like, I, he's been a huge inspiration. The Stand was a huge inspiration for me. I love that book. Um, but then you have, you know, your other classics, H.P. Lovecraft, like, was incredible. Incredible at creating a vision in your head that you could – see the most fantastical things that you've never seen in your life in real life but you could see it in your head because he was so vivid with his descriptions it was so great but that's the thing is that i don't find it's really male or female when it comes to horror i think some of the same things scare us all but i think that there are some things that are more horrifying for men than there are for women and i think that there's some things that are more horrifying for women than they are for men so i think being a female horror author i'm able to tap into that a little bit easier know what shivers down my spine and i know i've had a couple of my female readers like with a, w one particular part in the book and they're like that that's a mess yeah. i couldn't go to sleep <laughs> like that carrie what's in your head <laughs> like because i'm super nice right and everybody's like you wrote this <laughs> it's great i love i don't know if i told you this in our many conversations we've had <laughs> in the last couple weeks i love interviewing female women horror authors more than more than filmmakers. Not, I'm not saying I don't mind. I don't mind interviewing what women filmmakers, yeah. but like women, like some of my best interviews I've ever had are with women horror authors, and 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 I don't know if I it's because this thing. Okay, I'm gonna admit something. It's it's I am when I'm interviewing a woman filmmaker, I don't feel like I'm as comfortable. I'm watching what I'm saying. I'm, I'm filtering what I'm saying. I'm Ooh, filtering yeah. my response. And and I feel like I have to do that, you know, especially in today's culture compared yeah. to my interview with a man. But when it comes to a, a woman, her author, some of the best interviews, it's like I can just talk while I talk. I'm comfortable. It's some of the most relaxed, chill, awesome people you ever meet. That's why I love them, right? I want to meet more of them because yes. I... It's, I mean, I can't filter myself. That's why I was nervous about doing the interview. I was like, what is going to come out of my mouth? There's no talent. Uh, I what? love that. But that's, uh, to be, be honest, like, I've never in my life been very apologetic about it. And so I can't picture anything changing. So I'm more concerned with other people's feelings, I guess, on my own. But. That's why I have, because I say crazy shit out of my mouth. And I'm like, oh, how would this come across interviewing with a woman? So that that's when I over filter myself and i don't think that's my natural self coming out in that interview yeah well that's the thing is you're going to get your best stuff from when you're being your actual self because i mean you can tell when people are stiff when you ask them a question it makes them uncomfortable and you can see them shift in their seat and you can mm -hmm. see them kind of looking around their eyes and things like that but i mean for me 
horror is something I've always been comfortable talking about. I've been obsessed since I seen Michael Jackson's Thriller when I was like, oh, nice. <laughs> I was like, this is everything I need. This is my whole life. I've been obsessed with everything horror. To this day, people ask me, like, have you seen XYZ movie? And then somebody will chime in and they'll say, Carrie doesn't watch anything that's not horror. So like the, <laughs> no, the notebook, have you seen the notebook? And then I'm like, yeah, no. And they're like, what? Well, you seen the notebook? I'm like, yeah, does anyone die in like some gruesome way? Because if not, then I'll probably, even if I do try to watch, I'm going to sleep 20 minutes in. There's no... <laughs> It's just been my obsession, and given the people that are around me have come to accept it, um, yeah. but they still don't understand it. And um, I've, because of that, I've had a lot of influence to draw from when I actually sat down to write my own story, because I knew how I felt about what I was seeing in society. I knew what I felt like I wanted to say, and the hard part was finding the right story to say it so when it came to me it was like a rock I remember I was watching um Donald Trump give a speech and it was the one where he made fun of that handicap reporter and I oh, watched yeah. I watched everyone in that crowd laugh and I was that's oh. when it hit me I was like this is it this is my story he's gonna like he'll the, the, I mean he could lead us right into the end of the world and these people would follow <laughs> him wearing their hats and I'm like okay well and I mean you have in Canada, I mean, I might not know this, but in Canada, we have kind of the same thing where we have um, not uh, Democrats and Republicans, but we have conservatives and liberals. Mm -hmm. And we have the same basic idea up here. And the thing is, is that I've noticed more and more, and the same kind of applies to you guys down in the States, is that we spend a lot of time fighting about our differences and what we don't agree on. But all of us are in the same sinking boat. Nobody can afford uh, housing. Nobody can afford groceries, right? And if we start talking about what we have in common, then what we have in common is that we're getting screwed by our government. 100%. So it's really easy for us to, where, in, where we're in the position where we're all struggling and we're all feeling that pinch, it's a lot easier for us to turn on each other because we feel like that's something we can do something about. The government seems like too big of a problem for us. But the minute that we all understand that we are in the same boat, and we're on the same side, we outnumber them, and then they're going to have to do something because it's the same down in your US country as it is up here. Nobody's doing anything. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying, I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to fix that. All they're saying is, I'm anti this, I'm pro that, like, and just stirring the pot even more. I would love to see a politician say something like, I'm going to fix healthcare. You know what I mean? I mean it. Yeah. Like, it's, it, it seems like the platforms recently have all been the same thing, where it's, I'm anti this, I'm anti that. And if you're pro this, then you're the enemy and they point the finger and everybody runs at the enemy and we're obsessing over things like Dr. Seuss and, 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 you know, um, Mr. Potato Head when we have old people that have to, that have to choose between medication and groceries. But yes. this is what we're doing about. And that's the thing is that we are all in the same boat. And the sooner that we realize that, the better it's going to be for all of us. And like this book highlights that, I think. Like, like for instance, I voted for Joe Biden the last election. If I don't anybody, vote. Okay. <laughs> but if somebody said to me right now, Travis, boy, Joe Biden's on a horrible job at being a president. And do, and do you know what my response would be? Yes, yeah. he is. Why doesn't would I defend? Nose. Why would I defend him? That's it, though, is that he doesn't know where his nose is. I mean, I remember saying to somebody when they said, oh, would you, I mean, it was hypothetical because I'm Canadian, but they said, well, would you rather vote for Joe Biden or Donald Trump? And I was like, I'd rather vote for a ham sandwich than Donald Trump. I didn't I was like, vote Joe for either Biden, one of <laughs> on the planet, And I would still vote for, he could be a ham sandwich. And I know that ham sandwich ain't doing nothing but getting eaten. And I would still vote for the ham sandwich over Donald Trump because I figured that the ham sandwich will cause less damage. I thought I it was going to be, I mean, I thought it was the safest option. But at the same yeah. time, Am I a fan of Joe Biden? Hell no. Joe Biden is doing a horrible job. Exactly. And that's, horrible that's job. And and well, I feel I like most people who together. voted for Joe Biden can't say that. There's, oh, well, he's doing better. He's doing better than Trump. Like, really? Is he? But I'm just saying, like, let's be honest. Yeah. And there and there's a lot of people who were Trump supporters who were saying, oh, did you say, oh, boy, Trump did horrible at that. Well, he did better than Obama. Like, it's like, huh? Like, yeah. you, you can't be honest that, hey, the person they, who's on your team is doing a bad job. And that's and, the thing, is that you have to have some humility, right? And you have to get to the point, it's like, I would say the same thing. Joe Biden doesn't know where his nose is half the time. Like, so, yeah, I get what you're saying. 
but does that mean that you retired the whole country because this guy's not doing a good job? Or like you go back to the last guy that wasn't doing a good job because this guy, maybe you try a whole new guy and see if they do a good job. And so <laughs> one in reverse, back to where you were already having a problem. I, I'm not saying like one's better than the other. They both have mm-hmm. their drawbacks. It's just that at this point, it might be a good idea to try something completely new because neither one seems to be working and no one seems to be happy. The people oh, that are disappointed in, in Joe Biden and then the representation he's making and the people that are Republicans are disappointed because some of them think, still think Donald Trump won the election. So everybody's sitting around sad and pissed off and whatever over something that has the potential to be changed. And oh, it's easy to fight with each other instead. But what I can't understand about in this country is we're afraid to we're afraid to elect a young president. When I say a young president, I think the age we, we're afraid to, you know, someone who's 40s, in their 40s. We're afraid to elect. Why are we electing dinosaurs with dinosaur ideas? They're not healthy. Let, let's be honest. Donald Trump is not healthy. He's old. Why are we in this country? Why? Listen, baby boomers are done. I mean, they they had their time in, in, in the spotlight. Why yeah. are we in this country? I don't know why. Why do we allow dinosaurs dictate where this country goes when they're not the majority anymore. I think for a long time, that was your biggest voting demographic. I think that's why that was happening. I think that for you guys, that that's slowly changing now that you have younger people coming out to vote. I think that that, that over the next four or five years that you guys will see a change there. But I'll tell you, in Canada, we have Justin Trudeau and yes. he's younger and mm-hmm. he's still an idiot. <laughs> It's, and he, he's the same as every politician because he's liberal. And I mean, I consider myself to have liberal points of view, um, but the party and the nonsense they do, I don't align myself with the liberals. No, I just have too much. liberal ideologies. But I tell people, I don't vote. They're like, well, why? You're wasting it. I'm like, I'm wasting it anyway. I'm choosing the lesser of two evils, and they're both lying to me. So I'm yeah. choosing who's the better liar. I said, you're asking me to take time out of my day to go all the way down, stand in line, register, vote, and and do this whole charade for a bunch of people that are lying to me anyway. And in the end, they end up in power, and then they get in there, and they fight about things like drag queens. I don't have time for this. Exactly. It's nonsense. (laughs) It's all nonsense. I mean, like they act like RuPaul's a new thing. I've known who RuPaul was since I was like four. Like, I don't know where to do information for anybody, but there seem to be a lot of surprised people about this recently. But in the end... The whole point of the book is just to show people that how ridiculous they look, really. It's going to come to the point where they'll be separated in their factions, right? They'll they'll have the believers and the non-believers like they do in the Bible um, and people that will be that will be crucified for their beliefs and yada, yada, yada. But um, it's the same dynamic that I see now where there's no one's going to be right. Everybody's going to be wrong, and they are going to be fighting tooth and nail over it about who's right and who's wrong. And even the people reading the book will choose a side. Mm-hmm. They'll have a side which they think is right and they think is wrong, and I'm going to prove to everybody that neither one of those signs is wrong. And if you could think in your own head about what you feel based on your morals, your values, and what you feel in your heart, then you'd be better led than listening to people telling you what to believe and what to feel and how to act. Like, people say that religion saved our world i don't know man i think that the advancement of society would have happened without religion i think that the i don't you know if jesus existed seems like a pretty good guy had some nice things to say you know uh did some nice things for people i mean if he did exist cool i don't disagree with following around that guy he seemed to be a nice dude but there's a whole bunch of bullshit on either side of that story that just the continent of africa is way more religious than North America would ever be. Yeah. And I've been to Africa many a time. And it's way more religious than yeah. North America would ever be. Hmm. And look at how far they're behind technology wise, health wise, education wise. Just res- I mean I mean it's so fucked up there. Yeah. And they're well, the most religious people in the whole entire world. Well, they're, I mean, they're waiting for God to save them, right? Like, and then you get that story with not just Catholicism, but with a lot of religions where you're going to be saved. If you act right, then they'll come, they'll save you. So a lot of people just sit, are sitting around waiting to be saved. I know people that will, um, that I've interviewed that will give like 75% of their paycheck to the church because they have 
whatever re- religious leader that has convinced them that if they donate enough, most of it's usually old people. But if they donate enough, that they basically can buy their way into heaven. They're buying good deeds. The thing that gets me about it is that I think that with old people, I love old people. I'm a huge fan of anyone over the age of 60. Um, but I do feel like these are still people and we don't know what they've done in their life. So to offer them salvation through the form of donations, you're selling out your own religion. And it just seems to be a running theme that I see in organized religion as a whole, because I know a lot of people think that I'm focusing on Catholicism. And I mean, to a certain degree, that's true, because my the book of Revelations and all of this stuff happens in the Christian Bible. So to a certain degree, that's true. But as we go along in the story, I do plan to introduce other things from other other lines of faith that kind of they all kind of coincide with each other. Like they all kind of branch off into the same ideas and then they phrase it different ways and then they get mad at each other for it, Mm -hmm. which is really weird. Um, They so, for example, um, Allah was a prophet. Right. And. Muslims believe that Jesus was also a prophet and Christians get real mad over that because no, he's the son of God and that's the end of it. And if you don't agree with that, then you're going to burn. And it's just like, wow, none of us were around for this. I mean, they could be right. You could be right. That's like when people, I've had a lot of people assume that I'm an atheist. A lot of people assume that I'm an atheist. And when I tell them I'm agnostic, they're like, well, what's that? And I'm like, that just goes to show how far you've thought into this because I'm not an atheist. I can, I'm fully willing to admit that I don't know. And I'm okay with that fact. I'm okay with not knowing lots of things. I'm still here and there are all kinds of things I don't know. But I find that there are some people that have a really hard time accepting that they don't know. And they said, the book says this. I'm glad your book says this. This is Harry Potter. You know what it says? Like, and it's, it, they, they don't like the comparison. And I understand I'm not making judgments on your faith and making judgments on your decisions. I'm, I'm judging you on your decisions and what you choose and how you choose to weaponize your faith, whatever faith that is. And I've seen that happen a lot recently too, with the weaponization of faith that people think this is my faith. And if you don't follow it, you're going to, you're going to suffer the consequences. You guys in the poor, the poor, um, Roe v. Wade thing. I feel so bad for, um, the women down there because it's almost like they're going backwards into the roles that they were supposed to fill in the Bible in the first place, which is not pretty for any of us. So I don't know. I'm, I don't like the way, because there are really good people. I've watched faith do, make people do amazing things. I personally know a family, a whole family that has like eight kids or something. Cause they don't believe in birth control. They take these eight kids to different spots in the world every year to help build shelters, to help feed the homeless, to help do all these amazing things. And so I don't discredit faith and what it can do for people, but the way that it, the way that people weaponize it to get what they want is disgraceful. And the fact that you say that you're doing it in the name of this God that you're supposed to say is loving and caring and cares for all of the creatures that he created, you're a hypocrite. And people are really mad when you point that out. Because a lot of people assume that I'm some kind of atheist or something that's like a horror channel. But I'm oh, yeah. actually, I actually follow Christianity. I don't say I'm a Christian because... I don't live my life like a Christian. See, that's the thing. Yeah. I, listen, I drink, I swear, I'm vengeful, I'm all of that stuff. I'm spiteful, I'm all of that stuff, right? Yeah. That you're not supposed to listen. If you fuck me over, I'm going to fuck you over 10 times but, more. That's I, the way I, I am. But they now, say I feel not in the Bible. So <laughs> still now, I strive to be every day to be to live like a Christian, but I'm not mm. a Christian. No, no, yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'll fuck somebody up in the street. If, 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 if you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. Like, it, it is the way it is. Man, I mean, I, Jesus was flipping over tables. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> it happens. I mean, and he seemed pretty vengeful to me. I don't know. He was pretty mad. Uh, I'm just giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God. But he was not happy when he said <laughs> any of that. So that's the thing is that I don't. Like, it's Jesus, nice guy, man. A lot of great moral lessons sewn into some beautiful language that's in the Bible. But then you get into the other parts, Psalms, and you get into um, Corinthians, and you get into a lot of this stuff where it just becomes more rules and do this or God's going to be mad and do that or God's going to be mad. And if you don't act like this, God's going to be mad. 
And Jesus spends the whole time talking about how nice God is and how much he cares about everybody and loves everybody and whatever. And then the minute that we take him out of the picture, it goes into this vengeful God that hates everybody and, and wants to, you know, wipe the planet and everything you do is a sin. And it, it makes, if you actually try to follow that, you could easily drive yourself crazy. It's impossible. Right. It's impossible not to sin. Well, you set the expectation, and then you, you have so many people that are going to be disappointed that they can't live up to it. And I think that yeah. that's unfair to set that expectation from the beginning. I mean, I personally, I believe that I remember hearing what the Egyptians believed about how, kind of like our St. Peter, when they get to the gates, they uh, weigh your heart against a feather. And if your heart is heavier than the feather, then you don't get in because it means you're carrying guilt and shame and all these things. Um, and I think that kind of sums it up, like for me, with my belief system, I guess, is it's more of, of a, a ratio. <laughs> like, yeah. I might have done some shitty things, but I did a lot of good. So it kind of balances out. But sitting around and feeling bad for, you know, every time you jerk off, like, Jesus, like, could yeah. you imagine? Like, <laughs> I, I, I grew up, I grew up in the 80s and I grew up in the church area. And I remember, like, even my mother, my parents, like, it, it, especially in the African American community, back back in the day like if you had a child out of wedlock you know what i mean if you grew up and you, your child was called a bastard it was you had a child out of wedlock and it was a thing and they would but here's the thing they wouldn't criticize the father they would criticize the, the mother girl or the mother yeah but things have um slowly switched that all children are being born out of wedlock in this country very few children in this country are born out of, especially in the African American is born out of marriage. And marriage rates are going down now. It is. Because it's, it ties into the whole, um, people are moving away from religion because marriage is a religious ceremony. It's the same as when you ask me, are you married? I'm never getting married, man. I don't believe in that whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, me, marriage is just involving God and the government. I'm not religious, and I'm, I don't even vote, man. So I'm not interested in having either one of their approval on whatever I'm going to do. But the, the attendance for church has been steadily declining over the past 10 years. And marriage rates have been declining along with it because it's a religious ceremony at heart. A lot of women are getting to the point where it's not just about the the – Problem, honor, honor, love, and obey thing. It's gone to the point now where a lot of them refuse to be seen as as property. This whole thing started off as trading women for property, and then society sold us this idea that not only is this something that we want, but this is something that we're willing to spend tens of thousands of dollars on to get. And not only on top of it, now you have movies like things like Bridget Jones's Diary, where it presents it in such a way that this should be the goal of our life. And I think more and more women are starting to recognize this and move further and further away from it, more in uh, more in a retaliation sense than anything else. I don't think it's that, that women don't want to be in long-term committed relationships. I think it's that it's getting to the point where they're recognizing the patriarchy behind it, and they're just not interested anymore. They have bigger aspirations for themselves than to get married and find a husband, like have the big wedding and whatever, because a lot of the women that we've known growing up, my mothers, my aunts, things like that, all did that. They got to that point, had the big wedding, whatever, and then they all told me the same thing. So we did all these things, and then when it was over, we had the kids, and we're like, now what? Because we didn't have any other goals or aspirations for ourselves. Now it was just about taking care of our husband and our kids. And a lot of these women spiraled into depressions that they couldn't get out of because there was, to them, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And I think that our generation of women just refuses to go out like that. And I, I think, think, and yeah. I could be completely wrong, and the hate um, comments might be coming out. I, I might be canceled tomorrow. But <laughs> listen, I, I, we're going together. <laughs> but I think there's two reasons why women want to get married. And I, I could be completely wrong, but I'm I'm pretty sure this is the case. I could be completely wrong, and I am one. Yeah. <laughs> I think number one reason is the fiasco, the, the wedding, the dress, the ring, the, 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 the show. Yeah. The show. I and and I think most women in their mind to they they think that they're worthless or less of a woman if they do not go through that show. It it doesn't matter if it leads into divorce. Yeah. They need they need to say I've been married and I've been to the show. I've had people ask me um have you ever been married and I said no and they say why not? 
like, I, I don't know, do you, what, I mean, I didn't have an answer prepared. I didn't know I was going to be quizzed on my life choices. But I get a lot of that, like, well, why not with the luck of, like, why? What's wrong with you? Like, and it's just mm-hmm. like, I, I'm just cool being here, man. I just, you know, I'm happy to be part of whatever's going on. I don't need, the big show is the big thing, though. You're right about that. Like, it's a lot of money. It's a 